I'd like to say a big thank you to every man, every father, um, for the sacrifices. So my, my wife knows that one of my major complaints is always, oh, there's a song about sweet mother, there's a song about, um, you know all those songs, but you won't hear anything, sweet father, no, nothing, <laughs> you know, <laughs> you know? Um, so they, they say, oh, there's no one like my mother, and all those things. I, I'm not teaching you men to beef, I'm just confessing, okay? Um, but it's always beautiful when um, men at least get some recognition on the one Father's Day you have. I, I have to stress that. The very one Father's Day you have in, in the year. Women have like, uh, I don't want to exaggerate, like 85 or something. You know? um, they put it in different ways. Mother's Day, International Women's Day, National Women's Day, Regional Women's Day, and, and all kinds of Women's Day. And we must celebrate all of them, right? Yes. So the the one we have, we we'll guard it jealously. <laughs> so to every man, thank you, thank you so much for all you do. Thank you so much for the sacrifices you make. Thank you for being there, for being present, okay, for guiding and for guarding, okay, your your families. It can be a bit tough. Typically, the box stops with you, right? Um, and then you, you just keep going at it and grinding and all of that. And it's not like anybody has um, a prototype to work with, right? And so from time to time, we we'll fumble our way through these things, okay? But there's a whole lot of love there, a whole lot of uh, uh, maturity, you know, responsibility, leadership uh, that we provide in our homes. And today, I say thank you. God bless you. Okay. There are times when it doesn't um, feel as much fun, but through it all, we keep going. And the Bible says you will see the travel of your soul and you'll be satisfied. In other words, you will see the result of your effort, and you know it's all been worth it. And so in the name of Jesus, the result of your efforts will be astounding. In the name of Jesus. I pray for every man in this house, everyone watching online, that the Lord will continue to keep you. He will continue to bless you. As you lead your families, God will lead you. In the name of Jesus, we declare that nothing will cut you short. With long life, Jehovah will satisfy you. He will show you his salvation. You will raise amazing kids. In the name of Jesus, your beautiful wife will be with you to the end of days in the name of Jesus and nothing will go wrong with your homes your position no one else will take and in the name of Jesus God will continue to bless you and to make you prosper more and more it takes wisdom to lead and God will give you that in many folds in the name of Jesus Father, we thank you. Thank you for every father in this room, every father watching online, every father connected to PCG in one way or the other. Every father anywhere being present, paying attention, nurturing, guiding, guarding. Lord, we receive a renewal of strength for them in the name of Jesus. We ask, Lord, for peace in their hearts. Yes, we know. They, they say the suicide rates among men is higher than among women. Depression is higher among men. Typically, men find it difficult to speak up. But, Lord, let your Holy Spirit guard our hearts, strengthen us in the name of Jesus. 
And this fatherhood journey continually guide us. If there is any of us carrying residue of weak parenting that we experienced, anyone raising kids angrily, raising kids in a way they shouldn't, Lord, we ask for your help for them in the name of Jesus. And if there's any father here concerned about bills, you are our shepherd, we shall not want. Lord, we ask, because you're, you are Jehovah Jireh, the Lord our provider, your El Shaddai, the big-breasted, all-sufficient God, we ask, Lord, provide for us. Bless us in the name of Jesus. And for every father here, we receive grace for spiritual leadership. That as you lead your family, the Bible says it's not by power, nor by might, but by the Spirit of God. You will not lack God's Spirit in the name of Jesus. We thank you, Father. In Jesus' name, we pray. Can I ask that we put our hands together for men one more time? Thank you. All right, so um, like I said, hopefully we'll have that video up and running before the service ends, and then we can show it. Okay, we will continue in our discussion on uh, finances. And I have titled this one, Little is Much. Okay, Little is Much. I'll be reading a very, very popular um, parable from the scriptures. Matthew chapter 25, it's a long read, verse 14 to verse 30. 16 verses in there, and we are going to read it together. Okay. Yes, so let's go. Again, it will be like a man going on a journey who called his servants and entrusted his wealth to them. To one he gave five bags of gold, to another two bags, and to another one bag, each according to his ability. Then he went on his journey. The man who had received five bags of gold went at once and put his money to work and gained five bags more. So also the one with two bags of gold gained two more. But the man who had received one bag went off, dug a hole in the ground, and hid his master's money. After a long time, the master of those servants returned and settled accounts with them. The man who had received five bags of gold brought the other five. Master, he said, you entrusted me with five bags of gold. See, I have gained five more. His master replied, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. The man with two bags of gold also came. Master, he said, you entrusted me with two bags of gold. See, I have gained two more. His master replied, Good and faithful servant, well done. You have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. Then the man who had received one bag of gold came. Master, he said, I knew that you were a hard man, harvesting where you have not sown, and gathering where you have not scattered seed. And so I was afraid, and went out and hid your gold in the ground. See, here is what belongs to you. His master replied, You wicked, lazy servant. So you knew that I harvest where I have not sown, and gather where I have not scattered seed. Well then, you should have put my money on deposit with the bankers, so that when I returned, I'd have received it back with interest. So take the bag of gold from him and give it to the one who has ten bags. For whoever has will be given more, and they will have an abundance. Whoever does not have, even what they have will be taken from them. And throw that worthless servant outside into the darkness, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. All right, thank you for reading with me. Okay, so this is um, generally called the parable of talent, right? And um, we would typically tell this story 
uh, from different perspectives. Um, typically, we would share it to talk about talents um, as we understand it in today's world, meaning your inclinations, your giftings, you know. But in actual fact, it's about money, right? It is about money. But it still works when you use it for giftings and um, talents in that other way because the story itself starts with the fact that it was given as a gift to them, right? And so they all had it as gifts, although there was a caveat in there, each according to his ability, okay? And it's quite interesting how God does these things. Let he that think he stands take heed, lest he falls. That's First Corinthians 10. It says, For there is no temptation that has taken you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted more than you are able to bear. But with every temptation, also make a way of escape that you may be able to bear it. That, when it comes to temptation. But I dare say, it holds true when it comes to gifts, when it comes to blessings. When it comes to rewards, sometimes when we are asking God, Lord, bless me, he's asking, are you ready? Because there are certainly levels in God and levels of comfort that we may not be able to handle because we have not grown there. There's someone on someone saying, Galatians 4 verse 1, the hair, as long as he's a child, is not different from a slave, although he's the master of all. It says, but he's put under other people till he matures enough. In other words, the heir is the owner of everything, but there are certain things that only growth can give you. And that's a fact. And so I think that many times we have many prayers on credit somewhere, waiting there, and it's God saying, when you grow, then I can yield it to you. Because there are those things they cannot give to you because you are not there yet. The typical example we would give, and we have given a few times here, is the fact that no matter how rich you are, you will not hand your car keys to your six-year-old, your seven-year-old, your eight-year-old, you know, and help them get on the highway and say, son, let loose. Okay? Go, express yourself. Because you do know that it's not just the car that will suffer. The son will. As long as the son isn't grown, then the son cannot get certain things. And it is not because the father is unable to provide it. It is because the father loves the son. And sometimes I feel that some of our prayers are not getting answered because God loves us. Because God has seen our suicidal tendencies when he gives us certain things. God has seen what you would do with ten times your monthly income. He's seen it. I like when people say, God, test me. Oh, he did already. You just don't know. People say, if, if I earned this amount in a month, I'd do so much good. But where you are now, you want spread to be. I don't know if it occurs to you. There was a time when where you are now was a prayer point. And you are here now, and you want to scam God and say, get me to another level. Oh, but he got you here. And so there's no test me. Maybe not trusted. Oh, but tested. Well tested. And so for these guys, he then calls them together and gives one five bags of gold, one two bags of gold, one one bag of gold. And now you read it, and you are probably not surprised that the guy that fumbled everything was the one that got the list. Because, I mean, you have your resume right? 
It includes things you have done. The beautiful thing about resume is it helps you piece things together. You have said 1981 to 1982, I did this. 83 to 90, I did this. 92, and you are putting everything together and telling us that because you have done all this, it can get you here. And we think it's only for jobs, but it's for life. Because everything you have done gives God a good idea of your capacity. And so that guy got one, one got two, one got five. And the Bible says the one that got five immediately took it and invested. Immediately. The second one did likewise. And they made 100% returns. The third one, and maybe you've read that story before and felt for him, because I, I would usually feel for him. After all, he didn't spend it. The prodigal son was forgiven. He spent everything. This one did not. He just kept it. Brought it back. And gave the master some choice words. It would have been easier to say, take your money. He said, no, you need a lecture first. I know. You are wicked. <laughs> Gosh. And he was the one that fumbled it. And naturally, he's the one we focus on the more or the most. Because the whole idea of reading the Bible and preaching on Sunday is to admonish and encourage and learn from mistakes. Right? So, I titled this Little is Much. Because Jesus rounded up that parable by saying, give what he brought back to the guy that made the most money. He said, to him that has, more will be given. That sounds unfair, doesn't it? Because you would expect that to him that has, I mean, it's the way taxation works. Politicians will tell you in every campaign, we tax the rich, we increase their taxes, you know? And then the new one comes and makes the same promise, and you're wondering, did the old one do it? I don't know. It's not. I'm not rich yet. I would know when I'm rich. <laughs> But that's what you'd expect. Take it from the rich and give to the poor, right? But he said, to him that has, more will be given. And then he said a very interesting thing. To him that does not have, even what he has. I thought he didn't have. He says, even what he has from not having <laughs> will be taken and given to him that has much. It's quite interesting. I don't know if this has happened to anyone, but I've had moments in my life when it has occurred to me that maybe God is not sentimental. Maybe he's not emotional. You probably know, has there ever been a time in your life when you cried so much that if he was sentimental, he should at least. Has anyone cried like that? That you bullied him with tears? You know? A preacher said once in my hearing, he said, some of you try to oppress God with fasting and intimidate him. He said he has never eaten. <laughs> okay? So, so it's not like you look at him and say, ah, 40 days, she didn't eat. Wow. He, he has never eaten before. So, <laughs> yours can't be such a big deal. Right? It doesn't mean you shouldn't do those things. It just means that God is a God of principles. And we have said on this journey that there are people who we we'll never go to church. We we'll never pray. We we'll never fast. And we'll be rich. So we'll be rich. Are rich. You know some of them. And so I've always had issues with the preaching that says to you, if you don't follow God, you won't be rich. It's a lie. And we don't even need to prove it. You know. If, if you don't follow God, you won't be successful. It's another lie. If you don't follow God, you won't be healthy. Yet another lie. <laughs> right? Because there are principles that guide all these things. And if you follow those principles, because God is not a respecter of persons, then they work for you. And I've said before, you are not going to get on an aircraft and see me in the cockpit and sit down. Except there's something wrong with us. Right? So, but because you don't want to believe that I'll be trying to kill you, the first thing you say is, Pity, are you trained in this name? You know, you just want to be sure. With all the Holy Spirit I have, you still need to be sure that I got trained in it. And then when I answer you, 
and say no, but with God, all things are possible. So, please make yourself at home and put on your seatbelt. Then I speak in tongues too much, you know, and, and balance it up to increase your faith. It is well with you then that you chose to follow. But I have God, don't I? Yes. But there are certain things that only principles will do. I think it was Mike Murdoch that once said that throughout the Bible, you are going to read about the person of Jesus and the principles of Jesus. The person of Jesus gets you to heaven. The principles help you succeed here. Sowing and reaping is a principle. You carry seed, decide not to plant it. But then you go to the farm and speak in tongues. It's fine. When it's harvest time, those that put seeds there will go and harvest. When you go there, unfortunately, tongues are not physical. So your tongues are likely to have also grown. But you won't be able to pluck them because they are not physical. All you probably notice is that when you get there, you speak in tongues and the tongues have changed. Because you've grown as well. The only problem is that those tongues may not feed you. And so you go speaking in tongues and meet those people that harvested something. And say, I command you in the name of Jesus. It's principles. And I feel the need to help many Christians understand it. We have done considerable wrong many times in telling people that it's when you come to God that these things work. No, there's a lot of wisdom in the Bible. You submit yourself to the scriptures. You learn the principles in there. Yes, they work. But when you have pricked to somebody and said, my brother, you, oh, you're broke. And, and we sing those things in songs many times. Oh, I used to be poor. Then I gave my life to Christ. See how I look now. He buttered my bread. He sugar my tea. I think Jesus does more than buttering bread. And putting sugar in teas. He couldn't have died and resurrected for that purpose. There's more to it than that. And one of my biggest desires is that people who have a relationship with God, people who God can trust, people who God can talk to, also become people who are capable of receiving great gifts from God and multiplying them. When we wrapped up our teaching last week, we said one of the major things to consider for a Christian in finance is campaign. The things we push that you may not be able to push without money. Does someone understand? When a ministry goes on the media, they pay money. Has it occurred to you? Oh, it's money. Yes. Any advert you see is money. The more frequently it runs, the more expensive it is. You understand that. And we know that there are many things that we see on TV now that are becoming normal to us that were not normal 20 years ago. Does someone understand? Yes, campaign. Somebody pushed it. Pushed it in your face long enough, it began to look normal. And only God knows what will become normal in 10 years. When I look at our kids, sometimes I get scared. Already, there's a whole lot going on now. There's a whole lot being said in schools. A whole lot. And every time, I mean, for those that have young kids here, and you can engage them in conversations, every time I find that there are mindsets I need to change. There I am saying to them, no, 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 no. This is not the way it should be. This is the way it should be. Oh, but my friend said this. Many, uh, how many people here know that parenting now is not just two of you, you and your spouse, training those kids? Because they are talking to other kids who are probably more influential than them, who got their own ideas from their own parents, who got their own idea from their friends, and you don't know how many people are raising your kids for you. So maybe fathers can hear that on Father's Day. It's a big deal. And these things are being pushed, and you see it on the media, and it's getting into cartoons now. And there was a time... You could leave your kids in front of the TV and go away because they are watching cartoons. And now you can't. 
It's in games. They are there on apps. And every now and then I have to check on my kids and say, what are you watching? Explain that to me. Because they are being sponsored. Money is going into it. And I believe so strongly that when God wants his children to prosper, it is because these things ride on resources. And so while it's important that, yes, you come into a new country and, yes, you get a nine-to-five and you're able to pay your bills and, and change your cars and all of that, I believe strongly that there is more to it than meeting your immediate needs. Generations rest on you prospering and using it for God. Generations rest on it. There are people who are devoted to certain campaigns. Devoted. I read about a man some years ago in the U.S., a billionaire, who said he's going to devote most of his wealth to championing the cause for same-sex marriage. And he has been faithful. Very faithful. Yes. There are people championing every cause. And Christians will say, like the last guy, well, the money is little, so I'll keep it safe. I'll pick my bills, change clothes for my kids, change my car, and we're good. After all, it's not so much. And I become a billionaire. Maybe, just maybe. I can do it. And Jesus said to us here that the guy with one bag or one talent, depending on the uh, translation we read, what he's done with one is what he would have done with 10. Is what he would do with 50. Because he that is faithful in little, interestingly, did not say we will be faithful in much. No. He said he that is faithful in little is faithful in much. Is already faithful in much. It is you we are looking at, not the quantity you carry. It's you. You will tell us if it is safe to give you more. And so it was easy for him to say, you that made good use of what I gave you, then I feel safe to give you more. Have you ever loaned somebody money and they paid back in good time? Next time they paid back with interest. The third time, you are more than happy to give them, right? It's a track record. And I do hope that there's no one watching me here who somebody will loan money. Should I finish it? And when it's time to ask them, you know the tone of your voice when you're asking? And it changes when it's time to pay back. Someone says, can I have the money back? You say, why are you screaming? But, but that's the lowest tone, right? So should I go dumb? <laughs> Take a while, you screaming. What is it? I'm sorry, can I have the money? You ask. Gosh. And then you remind them that even America owes debts. I said, why didn't you go to China and collect it? Why did you come to me? You know, there are people that are that brutal, you know. And afterwards, you then go back. Oh, I, I read one story some, some time ago. It got me laughing. You borrowed money from someone. <laughs> and the person kept asking for it. And then one day you say to the person, you know what, even if I'm going to pay you back, this is the amount I can give. And that's it. Take it or leave it. Right? So, and I think it was maybe 10%. Or 20% of, of the whole thing. So the person had to say, you know what, okay, just, just send it. And by some providence, this person sends the money with, I think, one or two extra zeros. And then sends a message after, oh, that was a mistake. I'm sorry. Please send back. And what she wanted back was the balance of the 10%. 
that she was going to pay. You know? I felt some people are gifted in meanness. Some people can actually pray and fast and be mean on top of it. So it makes their meanness spiritual. With depth. But then you begin to build this and one day you are going to need a lot more and then you go back to the same person because somehow you don't have many people that are willing to bend over backwards for you. It's the world we live in. Not many people bend over backwards for you. If you find someone that does, please don't make them regret it. And so, one gets five. Gets to work immediately with it. Treated it as his own. But he knew very clearly that when the master comes, he will take it back to him. Second one, the same. Bible says that the third guy went and hid his master's money. It was clear to him from start. This is this guy's money. I have no business growing it for him. And so when he spoke to the master, the master did not just call him lazy. There was an adjective before that. Wicked. Because if it was yours, if you took it as yours, you would have done better with it. But because it's not yours, you decided to be mean. And of course, it then buttresses your laziness. And both worked. Listen. Little is much. It's a, a very simple sermon. God has already put something in your hand. Now, with which you can increase. It's put something in your hand that you can multiply. It's put something in your hand that people will chase after you for, pay you for, and I don't know what it is, but it's put that thing there. And it's saying, while you want me to answer your prayer, I also want you to answer my prayer to put that thing to work. Put that skill to work. Do something with it. Multiply it because we need it. And so the guy that got the five and then made it ten, Jesus said, you can come into, come, come, come and feast with me. Some, some other, I think the part in Luke says, put him in charge of ten cities. Now we can do business together. You see my heart. You're multiplying stuff. You are still my servant. You still work for me. But you're building capacity. You have more resources. You can do things. Listen, Christianity is about partnering with God. That's your concept of spiritual maturity. When you gave your life to Christ, the Bible says there was rejoicing in heaven. It's just like when you have a baby here, there's rejoicing all over the place. But at some point, you begin to demand growth of your child. First time the baby cries, it's sweet. If that cry doesn't stop one year, two years, three years, there's a problem. Because what you celebrate now may not be celebrated in three years. Growth is required. First time that child crawls, you are taking pictures and posting it. Oh, so sweet. So after a while, guy, get up. You can't keep crawling. What's this? And then the child takes the first step and you're oh, wow. At some point, you shouldn't be, what, stumbling anymore. And then you look forward to when you say, stop running, stop it, come back, right? And then you grow. And it's the way it works, spiritually. There are certain things God expects you to have gone past. And that's why he gave those things to you. Multiply it. Multiply it. Because the Bible did not say at any point that the master took those things back. He didn't take them back. He didn't. Even the last guy that said, take, he said, take it from him. He didn't receive it. Take it from him. Give it to the other person. God doesn't need it. He doesn't. It's partnership he wants. He has an agenda on this earth. He has things he wants to do. 
He wants to take suffering away from some people. He wants his own word to spread. He wants people to hear the truth. And it rides on money. And if it's not believers providing the money, then the money won't come from anywhere. Standard. But the big question is, before we get to that level, where are you now? What are you doing with what is given to you? With those skills? Is that brilliance? What are you doing with it? Some people are on jobs that are beneath you, and it makes sense if you're doing it because you're just getting in and you need to settle in. But at some point, comfort can be a prison. Yeah. When Jacob was blessing his children, he said of Issachar, I think that's in um, Genesis 50, he said of Issachar, he said, Issachar is a strong donkey. He said, but he got to a city and saw that it was good. He said, and he loved comfort. And so he laid down there and became a slave. Comfort can be a trap. When Satan was going to tempt Jesus, fasting, hungry, 40 days, the first thing he offered him was comfort. Eat. Unfortunately, in that moment, Jesus knew that destiny was more important than comfort. Because when you fulfill destiny, comfort is a byproduct. Seek first the kingdom of God, Matthew 6.33. And his righteousness and all these things will be added to you. We we'll find it easy chasing the things that should be added to us and expecting the kingdom of God to be added. No. There's one you should chase. There are others that come. And so I thought I'd share this very popular story and remind us that every gift you have Gift is self-explanatory. It was given to you. And he wouldn't have given that to you if he did not know that you had the capacity to do something with it. So what are you doing with it? If you're even going to start by writing it down and asking, well, God, what would you have me do with this? That's a start. But to belittle what you have because you think it should be more doesn't work. And what happens naturally when you have that kind of mindset? The receiver's mindset. Always receiving, never thinking of multiplying, never thinking of giving back. What happens is you begin to develop bad blood. First against people then against God himself. And I have met people who are mad at God. Oh, seriously mad at God. Because it's been unfair to them, they say. A woman said to me once, I used to be afraid to say this, but I'll say it now, God is wicked. I was from a place of pain. She then explained the wickedness to me. But he actually wasn't being wicked. She was the one not doing what she was supposed to do. But I couldn't say it. Her eyes were on fire. I probably would not be here today. <laughs> and there are many times when we hang things on God that he has already hung on us. And we say, you're wicked. You didn't give me what I desired. I prayed. I fasted. And these days I'm there asking God, what should I even pray about? Because many times we say the wrong prayers. But it's counting on you. Little is much. You have something to start with. To him that does not have, even what he has will be taken. There's something everyone has. And what are you going to do with yours? I recommend that you even bring it back to the front burner today. Think about it. Write it somewhere. 
Listen, we have said repeatedly that your life is too small to be the central purpose of your life. You couldn't have been sent here so that you can, you can live long and buy a new car and go on vacation and die. No, there's got to be more than that. There's got to be more than that. So whose lives have you touched? What are you doing for other people? What are you doing that will outlive you? Jesus called the true riches. The one that when you cross from here to the other side will still be remembered. I'm not sure your car will be. I don't think so. Your clothes? I doubt it. Certain things will be remembered when you get there. And that's where to put the investment. And of course you know that if, especially with this recession, and inflation all over the place. If someone came to you with an investment opportunity with a 100% guarantee that in five years this thing would have yielded this and you know it, and you're going to put a lot into it, right? But now we're talking about the one that beyond five years will speak. But somehow, we don't want to think about it. Again, because immediate comfort can make you short-sighted. You just think there's no life after that. Newsflash. There's plenty of life after. And I believe so strongly that God would have us prosper here and enjoy afterwards. But he's given you something to start with. And it's because he has a huge agenda. I look forward to that time when we can feel as a church that God wants us to travel and go somewhere and do ministry work and we can have 50% of people in this church who can say we'll go together for one week, we'll go for two weeks because they own businesses that are thriving and they can go and do God's work and come back and touch lives and change cities and feed the hungry. That's why I believe God is taking us. Is it okay to start from here? Absolutely. As long as it's a start, not a destination. There's something God has given to you. Please, get back to it. Think it through. Write it down. Trust him for opportunities. Network. Do whatever it is you need to do. Build capacity. Read on it. I tell you, nine to five is fantastic because there's security there. You know at the end of the month, this will come, but is it really secure? One letter can change the whole thing. But you're telling yourself it's secure. And it's fine. Because not everyone will start a business. People have to work with people. It's okay. Some people are fantastic number twos, fantastic number fives. It's okay. But whatever it is God has given to you to do, I beg you, get on it today. Okay? Make your plans. Build on it. And it's as that begins to prosper on paper, you get a call from someone, your conversation will go in that direction and you find out that the person you needed for the next step had always been around you. Or because you buried it. It's just not showing. God has been answering us it's time for us to answer God. Okay? There are many, many things resting on our prosperity. And God has started the work and given you something. I beg you, and I've said it repeatedly, Christianity and selfishness don't go together. The beginning of Christianity, for God so loved the world that he gave. That's where it starts from. And as we trust God to prosper us so that we can help many other people, you know that a funnel that passes water is usually not dry because it has to go through you. And so he said to Abraham, I will bless you and make you a blessing. That's the destination. And so let's remember, the little we have is the much. It's the seed principle. There's plenty inside that small seed. Put it where it should be. And you can't tell how far it goes.
I believe it's the mind of God that we're saying now. So please, just get on it today. And I trust God to guide us. I trust God to open our eyes to the things he's given us in the name of Jesus. Can you take a moment and talk to him? I don't know where this has hit you. I think you should talk to him. And ask for help. Wherever you have been like the last guy. And ask for grace to be like the first guy, the second guy. Lord, whatever it is you have given to me. That my need to play safe has prevented me from using. Forgive me and help me. I know there's more to me than this. I know I'm bigger than this. I know I have all I need to start with. Help me today. Put faith in my heart. Put a passion for you and your work in my heart. Deliver me from selfishness. Help me love other people. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Lord, we are grateful for the gift of your word. The reminder that we are more than this. The reminder that we need not play safe. The reminder that our prosperity is of immense importance to you. Thank you. And so, Lord, today I pray for my brothers and sisters here. Open our eyes, Lord. Open our eyes to see what you have given to us. Open our eyes to see what you expect of us. Deliver us, Lord, from small thinking. Deliver us, Lord, from the temptation of security. In the name of Jesus, grant us, Lord, growth. The ability to think the way you think. Grant us, Lord, the desire to take on big issues. In the name of Jesus, I pray for someone listening to me and saying, well, I'm struggling to get it together. Struggling with my own finances at the moment. How is it that I'm expected to go big? But Lord, we know that you spoke to Gideon when he was hiding from, hiding from the enemy. Your angel got to him and said to him, you mighty man of valor, when he was hiding. Because you do not call us as we are, you call us as we can be. Father, open our eyes. Help us to see how mighty we are. Help us see how prosperous we are. Deliver us, Lord, from every mindset limiting us in the name of Jesus. And Lord, as we sit on this plane and decide to do your work indeed, do your work even beyond the walls of a church, I begin, I speak favor. Favor begins to show up in your lives doors begin to open to you in the name of Jesus. You begin to find resources. You begin to find alignment. You begin to build relationships in the name of Jesus. I declare that he that is struggling today helps many people struggling tomorrow. I declare that where you are is not your end. You will get bigger, more prosperous, in the name of Jesus, I declare it is well with you. In the name of Jesus, as you choose to partner with God today, the God that loses no battle, the God that is never overwhelmed, I declare that as you choose to partner with him, nothing overwhelms you anymore. Nothing depresses you anymore. Nothing defeats you anymore. 
in the name of Jesus. Today I build a wall of fire by the power of God around you and everything that matters to you. No evil will befall you. No plague will come near your dwelling. In the name of Jesus. Your seeds are preserved. Your mind is preserved. In the name of Jesus. Today I speak an end to depression. I speak an end to emotional pain. Peace floods your heart. In the name of Jesus. This new week, I declare the lines are falling to you in pleasant places. The Lord is your shepherd. You will not want. This week, his rod and his staff will comfort you. When you go to him in prayer, you will know what to do. As you speak to him, he will speak to you. When you read the word of the Lord, wisdom will come from there. In the name of Jesus. If you shout this week, it will be for joy. If you cry, it will be for joy. In the name of Jesus. As you get your notes or get whatever it is to count the gifts that God has given to you. The Spirit of God will guide you. He will speak to you. In the name of Jesus. I declare it is well with you. Now and forever. In Jesus' name we pray. Can I hear louder? Amen. Hallelujah.